Okay, what I'm not gonna do is I'm just gonna jump into Resolve and show you how you can set your project up so you are using the correct EOTF and color gamut for your monitoring. Um, now there's several different ways of doing this. As you can see, you've got lots, you've got nodes, you've got Resolve Color Management and you have ACES. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna jump into Resolve now and here we go. I have a Blackmagic RAW file. Now, said so the first way you can sort of change this file into your HDR, um, you know, the correct EOTF and the correct color space for your viewing, um, you can use a lookup table. Now, using a lookup table isn't ideal because for those of you who used lookup tables before, what you probably know is they're a mathematical equation, basically. They're a mathematical calculation between one set of values and another. The problem with that is the, the mathematical equation has finite values to it. So basically you've got to understand that you're working within the confines of that LUT. Um, so there's nothing wrong with doing it, but personally I think there are better ways of doing it in Resolve. But I will show you how you can um, use a look a lot to um, turn your your clip into the correct EOTF. So first of all, what I've got to do under the camera raw settings in here, what I've got to do is I've got to change the gamma to something that the LUT will understand. So what I'm going to do with this, as you can see, I've got several in here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to Rec 709. So it's gamma 2.4. Then what I'm going to do in my first node in here, I'm going to play a look a lot, and under the HDR ST2084, I'm going to say gamma 2.4 to HDR 1000 nits, and there we go. I am now working in the correct EOTF. As I said, I wouldn't do it that way because I'm not a big fan of using LUTs when you have things like Resolve Color Management and ACES to work with. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reset that. And I'm just gonna go back up to um, camera metadata. There we go. I'll use the camera metadata settings for this. So as I was saying is you can do a the correct transform via nodes, via resolve color management or via ACES. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through the resolve color management to begin with. So in your resolve settings under the color management option you can see by default you use the davinci yrgb but what i'm going to do is i'm going to use the davinci yrgb color managed and in the resolve color management preset what i'm going to do with this i am actually going to use the davinci wide gamma and i'll come um just a little bit more explanation as what the wide gamut is um in just a second. But what I'm gonna do in here is I'm gonna choose DaVinci Wide Gamut and then I'm also gonna choose Custom in here. So now as you can see, it gives me the input color space, the timeline color space, the working timeline luminance and the output color space. Now, as you can see in here, I've got the several options I've got. So the input color space, it doesn't really matter at this stage what the input color space is because I'm reading a raw file, um, Resolve is reading the metadata from the camera. Again, you know, I could set this to bypass and it wouldn't make the slightest bit of difference to my shot. Um, so the input color space, yes, obviously if you have QuickTime files, Resolve will take a guess of what the input color space is, but you might need to change it. With a lot of new cameras, when they receive, when you receive a raw file from a camera, it reads the metadata from the camera so it knows what the input color space is. Said so the timeline color space, I'm going to leave to DaVinci wide gamut for a second. And then as you can see, the output color space in here, I can go and choose whatever output I like. So as you can see in here, I've got the options of using the P3 space at various different values in either. Um, and as you can see, I can use the ST2084 EOTF or the HLG. So for this, I could actually use P3. I've also got the Rec 2020 ones as well. So I can say, we'll use Rec 2020 ST2084, a thousand nits. So I know it's my HDR color space, it's the right EOTF, and it's set for a thousand nits on the monitor. 
What you may get as well, just to point this out in this um, case, is you may get people asking about um, sending P3 files in a REC 2020 container. So basically you can send a P3 color space in a bigger REC 2020 container. So it sort of future proofs the file. Um, and you can do this in Resolve. This is where the limit output gamut comes in. So what you could actually do is you could actually say, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work with P3D65. I'm gonna limit the gamut, but when we deliver, it's gonna be in a REC 2020 container. Um, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna say a output color space. So it's gonna use REC 2020. The other useful um, option in here is the HDR mastering. So when you are working with sort of a domestic TV, you have to tell it what NIT value you're working with. And that's what this little checkbox is for. So you can check that box, enter a NIT value in there. Um, and again, you know, it'll set your TV up or it'll tell the TV the NIT value that you are working in. So again, if I hit save with that now, you can see it adjusts the color space. You'll notice when I set the color space up and it was the same when I used the LUT Resolve, the monitoring in Resolve, cannot read the EOTF. This is why monitoring becomes so important for HDR. Because trust me, this image on an HDR monitor would look totally different. So this is where monitoring, and I'm going to do it very shortly, I'm actually going to go through a little bit more about monitoring. Um, the one thing I did do in the Resolve Color Management that I mentioned was the DaVinci Wide Gamut, and people do have questions about that. I do just have a slide on this. So the DaVinci Wide Gamut is, as you can see, it's just this massive color gamut that you can just drop files into. So this, but basically the DaVinci Wide Gamut is what you're working in in Resolve, so it affects how your controls work. But this is really cool because if you have files from several different cameras, you know, you've got files from a Blackmagic and then files from a Red and then files from an Arri. If you drop them into a specific working color space like Rec 709, the controls might work slightly differently. So, you know, if you did the same grade on one clip and then copied it to another, if you're copying it from an Arri to a Red, the grade may copy slightly differently. You know, your shadows and your highlights would be slightly different. Because when you're working in a DaVinci wide gamut, it's dropping all these files into this really wide working color gamut. And what that means is all the controls sort of work the same way. And when you copy and paste grades between different clip formats, you know, between different camera formats, the grades copy and paste and don't look absolutely crazy like they did before because they're all working in this really wide gamut. And as you can see, there's no issues of going beyond, you know, not being able to show the full REC 2020 profile because the DaVinci wide gamut is way bigger than even REC 2020. So that's just something about, you know, you don't have to work in the wide gamut, but you do get some really nice results when using the DaVinci wide gamut and doing HDR grading. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to tab back into Resolve. So, you know, you can use color management and now my project is correctly set up for... Um, ST2084, REC2020 color grading. Now, it said is you can use the color management. You can also use ACES. So Resolve Color Management is great is if you're staying in the DaVinci world. So, you know, you're going to grade HDR and deliver from there. But, you know, you might have customers that are involved in projects or, you know, you might have, um, you yourself might be work with VFX houses that require um, clean plates as sort of EXR files. And you know, how do you send them the color management? Because DaVinci color management is obviously just for Resolve. But this is where ACES comes in. And you know, you've got ACES, ACES CC and ACES CCT. So I'm gonna use ACES CCT for this. I'll use version 1.1. And as you can see, the input device for transform, again, I'm gonna leave that to no input because again, ACES is the same as the um, Resolve Color Management, it can read the metadata from the camera. Um, the ACES Output Device Transform, as you can see, I'm using P3D65 ST2084 to 1000 nits. I could change that, you know, get it to match. 
So again, I can choose Rec 2020 ST2084 thousand nits. You can also see as well, you know, I was talking about the limiting the gamut. This is actually a setting in ACES rather than um, a separate setting that you get in color management. So as you can see, Rec 2020 ST2084 thousand nits, P3 D65 limited. So again, I could change that to ACES. You probably won't notice there's a very slight shift, but it, but again, ACES is doing its own conversion. For those of you who know it, it will convert, turn your camera log curve into linear and then back to ACES log. And it works very much like Resolve Color Management. All your controls have the same feel and work the same. Copying and pasting grades between camera files is much easier because said is their work, they're sort of being converted into a linear space and then they're all sort of working in ACES log. So as you can see, you can use ACES as well. Um, the other thing you can do is these um, color space transforms are project wide. And people often say, well, can I do it on a clip? Can I do it on the timeline? And the answer is yes, you can. So again, if I just put this color science back to YRGB, like so, my default, uh, DaVinci Color Management, you can actually use your open effects and have an, a clip set up in an HDR profile or a timeline. And again, this is really useful for when it comes to delivering files for like HDR 10, because what you end up having to do is sort of, you know, do two grades. But the great thing is, if you use nodes, you can just change the conversion node. You'll see in a second. So basically, again, if I wanted to use um, the color space transform, I do actually have it as a resolve effect, as an open effect. So as you can see, I've got a color trait space transform in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and apply that to the first node. And then I'm just going to apply a second node in here, and I'm going to apply another color space transform. So I've got two. So the first node in here, what I'm going to say, the input color space um, for this, this is from a Blackmagic um, Pocket 4K. So as you can see, I can say the input color space for this clip is Blackmagic Film um, uh, Pocket 4K Gen 4. The input gamma is Blackmagic Design Pocket 4K Film Gen 4. The output color space here is what I want to sort of be working in. So again, what I'm going to do with this is say, go and choose the DaVinci wide gamut and the output gamma, we also have um, what we call an intermediate gamma that has a huge dynamic range. So as you can now see, now what I can do is I'm now looking at the, I'm now sort of converting on this node here, I'm converting the black magic space to the DaVinci wide gamut. And then what I'm going to do on this node here, what it is receiving is the DaVinci wide gamma, the input gamma, it has got our intermediate gamma on. And then the output color space, I could then say, well, use Rec 2020 and the output gamma, we're going to use STU 2084 thousand nits. So there we go. Now what I can then do is I can do my HDR grading between these two nodes. The great thing is, is then if you wanted to say, you know, you might want to do a 600 nit version, what you can actually then do is just say, you know, on this node, you can simply say, well, do the output gamma, sorry, maybe you do it to 800 nit and change it that way. So yeah, you using the nodes, and again, you don't have to use the color space transform in here as well because there is also an ACES transform that works in the same way. Um, so you can actually um, you just use nodes if you want to do it on a single clip or just a timeline, for example. So they are that's the way you set your project up um, in DaVinci Resolve for the correct EOTF and color gamut that you want to use. So how do you actually set the monitors up in Resolve? So um, I'll show you. It's, it's again, it's relatively straightforward. It's it's a, a simple um, setting. So again, in your project settings, 
under your master settings in here, you can see you've got the video monitoring. So you can actually choose the video format. So whether you want to be HD, Ultra HD, 4K, um, you do have the ability to use 444 SDI. So for things like Dolby Vision, it's recommended that you use 444 SDI. Um, obviously, you've got the configuration in here for you know how you're connecting to your monitor. The use dual outputs on SDI becomes important when you are looking at things like Dolby Vision delivery, because what you have to do is basically with Dolby Vision to do a, a correct trim pass, you need two outputs, one for HDR and one for SDR. And when you do a Dolby Vision analysis in Resolve, it will send one signal out of um, an SDI out of one of the SDI. So if you've got two SDI outputs on your capture and playback device, it'll send the HDR down one SDI and the SDR down the other SDI. Um, that's why things like uh, the Deck Link uh, Mini Monitor 4K isn't suitable because it's only got one SDI output. The other thing um, that um, I'll just mention is the data levels. If you're delivering Dolby Vision, it is recommended that you use full data levels. For the rest, at the moment, you carry on using video levels. So that's it. That's basically how you set you set up the the monitor monitoring. Also, as well, the video bit depth. Um, I don't have it in here, but you know, if I had a Dolby license and then the monitor set up, um, the video bit depth you could choose twelve bit in there as well. The other checkbox and the other important checkbox is the enable HDR metadata over HDMI. So if users are using a um, domestic TV, sorry, for, a, for HDR. So if you guys are using a domestic TV for HDR, then you have to trigger, remember with the monitors, you have to trigger the TV into HDR mode. And that's where this checkbox comes in because basically what that does, it sends the HDR flag down the HDMI cable and it will trigger your TV into HDR mode. Excellent. Okay, moving on. Okay, so now we, you know, we've we've been through the the setup in Resolve about you know setting up the correct color management. Um, you know, we've looked at how you can set your monitors up so you know exactly what you're looking at. Now what we simply want to do is go in and, and sort of how do you grade HDR? So what I'm going to do is said, I'm just going to um, jump back in to Resolve. Um, again, I've been messing around with my project. So what I'm going to do in the color management, I'm just going to go back to using my color managed. And again, I'm going to use the wide gamut. Uh, yep. I'm um, REC 2020 ST2084, that's okay. There we go. Now, the first thing um, I'd probably want to do is I'm going to change my video scopes to the HDR scopes. So, in the bottom, oh, sorry, in the bottom right hand corner, obviously, you've got your scopes. In the top right hand corner of those scopes, you've got three dots. And if I click on those, you have a waveform scale style. And as you can see, you can work in 10-bit or 12-bit, but I also have an option, which is HDR ST2084 HLG. So if I click on that, you can now see the values change into a NIT value. So I now have got an idea of where 1,000 NITs is on my system, where zero is on my system. So now I've got a bit more of an accurate scope to show me what I'm actually doing in Resolve. Now, because with HDR, the temptation is to just crank, because you've got a brighter screen, the temptation is to bright and just crank everything up. And that's not the way HDR works. Remember, it's about the dynamic range. So your shadows are as important as your highlights. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to apply a, um, a grade in here. Now, admittedly, bearing in mind you're looking at my display in HDR, in Resolve, which is not showing me the true HDR, but this will give you an idea. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to apply a gray to this. Now, this is just my default um, pre-built node tree. So all I've got in here is, is basically I've just got a, a balance node. So it's just balance the color of the shot a bit. All of these parallels are basically my defaults um, for when, you know, they're just default parallel nodes. So I've got them. So I've got power windows so I can split the screen up and I've got masks. Uh, and, you know, I've got a default qualifier node at the bottom. So, you know, just as an example, I've got a bottom window here that, as you can see, is, is just a these parallel nodes just sort of break up my shot. So again, if, if I just wanted to sort of darken the foreground a touch, I can probably do that quite easily. So this is just a pre-built node tree. I've not done anything really special with this at all. However, as I said, the temptation is when people get into HDR, the temptation is, is to go, well, you know, the screen's brighter, so let's just make everything bright. So, you know, the temptation is to go, oh, let's, well, we'll, we'll push the, we'll keep the shadows as they are, but we'll just sort of crank everything else up. And that's not how HDR grading works. Um, again, because if you think like how you shoot, you know, how you expose on a camera, if you've got a subject um, sitting in bright sunshine, you don't expose for the sunshine, you expose for your subject. And the same goes with HDR. You know, quite often this, you know, remember the sort of the average picture brightness level is my subject here is about where I'd want it to be. And, you know, the midtones are a, around 100 nits. So that's fine. What I want to do is just sort of start to lift the really kind of peak highlights to really get across the dynamic range of this shot. So the way you used to do this, and don't get me wrong, you still can do it like this, is you'd use the log wheels. So obviously the log wheels give me sort of greater control of specific areas. So shadows, midtones, and highlights. So again, what you'd normally do with this is said, what I just want to do is I just want to pick, pick up these sort of peak highlights around the clouds. So using my log wheels, I just sort of stretch, you know, the, the sort of specular highlights. I just sort of stretch those up a bit. And again, hopefully you can see that on the monitor, but you can see these sort of, the, the area around the clouds is getting brighter. Same with the shadows. What I truly do is sort of just get the shadows just a touch darker. So, you know, I'm now seeing a kind of really nice dynamic range. What I then maybe want to do is go a stage further. So to really just make this, the specular highlights just pop a little bit more, I'd go onto another node here. Now, basically what I've done on this node, I'm using the log wheels again, but I've limited the ranges of the wheels. So now the highlight just affects the very, very top end. So again, these are the speculars that I can really push in. And again, what I'll do is I'll crush them so you guys can actually see it. So you can see I'm just getting these specular highlights just bright. And it's the same with the shadows as well. I can just pull just the very bottom end of the shadows down. So these areas here go dark. You know, I'm still sort of showing a lot of um, detail in the shadows, but I'm still, what I may just do is, uh, I'm just going to disable my window there that might make it a little bit better so now as you can see I can just push and again I may crush it so you can see it on my screen so again I'm just sort of pushing in areas of darkness in here but I'm, I'm sort of keeping the detail and there we go so now I am now you can see we're getting the the high dynamic range you know my subject is still exposed correctly but I've got my sort of peak specular highlights my shadows down here again I, I can sort of go into my curves as well so again, if I just want to maybe sculpt the contrast a little bit further, I can do this with the curves. So that is the way um, you commonly graded HDR. Remember, you're not looking at cranking everything up or pushing everything down. You're just looking at getting your specular highlights nice, your shadows. Now, as I said, is before Resolve 17, you'd, you'd kind of use the log wheels to deliver this sort of grade. Um, but now with the new HDR tools, again, if I just apply that grade in here, you can see, again, same sort of set node tree, but I've only got one node after my initial grade because the HDR tools 
um, get around having to use kind of the log wheels because as you probably know they range from black which is the very darkest part of the image all the way to the specular highlights but what I can also do with the HDR tools is if I, I take a look at the zones just see if I can get the zones to appear there we go so as you can see I've got a, basically a, a histogram of the zones so where these wheels sit in accordance with my um, luminance However, at the moment, what I'm doing, these zones are working within the timeline color space, which is the wide gamut. But what I could actually say is, well, actually with this, what I really want to do is these, th this display, these zones, I actually want them to work in my output. So I'm going to choose Rec 2020. Um, and then the gamma, I'm actually going to use ST2084 thousand nits. So as you can see, I've now got a waveform, uh, sorry, I've now got a histogram rather, that um, is showing me kind of the value levels of my actual output. So yes, I'm working in the DaVinci wide gamut, but this is actually showing me the levels on the output and where the zones sit on the output. So now, as you can see, I can go in and I've just got a tiny little bit in the specular so again, you know, with the specular highlights, you could just push those up. And as you can see, it's, it's just getting the specular highlights right at the top. Again, I could sort of push those highlights up a little bit further. Again, the same with the shadows. There's, there's, there is actually um, an, element, an area of the image within the black area. So again, what I can actually do is just sort of bring those black levels down a touch. I think I'm not quite getting there. So maybe just push the dark level down a bit. So as you can see that because of the HDR tools, it negates the need for um, working with the log wheels because the HDR wheels, that's why they sort of call the HDR wheels. Yes, they can work for any sort of content um, but they're great for HDR because you don't have to use kind of multiple nodes um, and multiple versions of the log wheels because you've got all your control within here. And the great thing as well with these wheels is um, you can control the exposure and obviously you can control the exposure, but you can control the saturation as well of these images, of these sort of areas of brightness. So again, you know, in the highlights, if I just want to up the saturation a little bit, I can do. I can actually maybe just push some color in just into those specular highlights. So again, when you're working with HDR, it gives you greater control because you're working with a larger color volume. You're going to deliver in a larger color volume. And these wheels just give you that control. Is in, in your specular highlights, if you want to sort of push a little bit more color in there, something that you may not be able to sort of deliver in an SDR file, you can in HDR. So this is where the HDR tools come in. You can still use the log wheels, but the HDR tools now, as you can see, they save you a huge amount of time. But the key thing when grading HDR, the first mistake that a lot of people are new to HDR grading make is they just crank everything up because the screen's brighter. They've got to think they've got to make everything brighter. And the truth is you don't have to. You know, you've got somebody sitting outside in the sunshine, keep them at about 100 nits, and then when you've got little glints of sunlight bouncing off things, they're the things you can make 1,000 nits. So that's said something to bear in mind. So that's the setup for Dolby, the Dolby Vision workflow. So um, what I'm going to do is I'll just jump back into Resolve and show you exactly how that works. So again, yeah, the idea behind Dolby Vision is the fact that you do your HDR grade and then you analyze the file and it gives you what we call the SDR trim pass. So first of all, what I've got to do is I've got to go into my color management settings again and I have to enable Dolby Vision. So if I hit save in here, now Dolby Vision is enabled. You can see within my left panel in my color page, I now have a Dolby Vision button. And if I click on this, um, it takes me into my Dolby Vision controls. 
what you then do, and you can do this for an entire timeline or a group of selected clips or one individual clip, is you can simply say analyze selected or all, as you can see. So if I say analyze selected, it will basically go through, analyze the shot and give me a tone mapped 100 nit BT709 1886 shot. So as you can see, I have you know a lot of different target output settings in here, but basically what the Dolby Vision does is with the tone mapping, it gives you an SDR version. And again, as you see, if I toggle this on and off, again, it's looking slightly odd because again, on my screen in Resolve, it's, it is looking at the trim pass. But again, this would look a lot better on a monitor. But as you can see, it's giving me the trim pass. Um, again, the great thing you, one of the great things with Dolby Vision as well, I could do a 600 nit trim pass as well. So let me do an analysis on that. I don't think, yeah, there's a slight, you can see there's a slight difference in that. Um, but again, again, if I just go back to the 100 nit one, you can see the difference. So that's how you do the analysis for Dolby Vision. The one thing you will notice that these tools here are grayed out. So when you've actually done the analysis and you want to adjust the SDR trim pass, you need a Dolby Vision license to access these files. You need a Dolby Vision license to access these files. HDR10 Plus um, works in the same way. Um, HDR10 Plus works in the same way. So again, what you'd have to do is I've got to enable HDR10 Plus in here. You can see I've got another option. And with this, what I would do is go into the color page, go into HDR10 Plus. I'd say analyze selected shot and it gives me a tone map as well. You can see these tools are grayed out at the moment. Um, we have taken that under advisement. That is what we have been advised by the developers of HDR10 Plus, that at the moment these tools are grayed out. But again, as you can see, it's the same sort of workflow in the fact that you can analyze the file. It gives you a tone mapped file. So you have basically an HDR and SDR version. When it comes to delivering um, Dolby Vision, for example, um, if you're going to deliver an IMF file, then what you can obviously do within the IMF file, as you can see, you've got Dolby Vision files in here that embed the metadata within the file. If you are having, if you're going to go and use an external device to create a Dolby Vision file, um, what you can actually do is you can export the metadata. So again, under the export options, you can see I've got a Dolby Vision XML export. And also for the HDR10 Plus, I've got the JSON file that will do that. So as you can see, you've got the two options in here that will actually allow you to export the metadata. As I said, if you're building a file outside of Resolve, um, you know, sorry, if you're going to build a file that is basically takes the metadata and embeds it into the video file. Um, that can't be done in Resolve. You need third-party hardware to actually do that. For things like for things like HDR10 Plus, it's just two separate grades. But for Dolby Vision and HDR10 Plus, the analysis tools are available to you in the um, color management settings in your project. And as you can see, you can do the analysis that gives you an SDR trim pass. But for Dolby Vision, you need a license to unlock the trim pass tools.